the pinafore picture book the story of h m s pinafore by w s gilbert preface to my young readers i have been asked to explain to you how it comes to pass that this the story of a well-known play is now placed before you in the form of a tale in the first place many very young ladies and gentlemen are never taken to the theatre at all it is supposed by certain careful papas and mammas that very young ladies and gentlemen should go to bed at an early hour and that it is very bad for them to sit up as late as half past eleven or twelve o'clock at night of course this difficulty could be overcome by taking them to morning performances which are so called because they invariably take place in the afternoon but there are drawbacks even to morning performances unless you are seated in the front row of the stalls where the band is sure to be too loud or in the front row of the dress circle which is a long way off the enjoyment of very young ladies and gentlemen is pretty nearly sure to be interfered with by the gigantic cartwheel hats decorated with huge bunches of wobbling feathers that ill-bred and selfish ladies clap upon their heads nowadays whenever they go to a theatre in the daytime a third reason and perhaps the best of them all is that very young ladies and gentlemen find it rather difficult to follow the story of a play much of which is told in songs set to beautiful music and all of which is written in language which is better suited to their papas and mammas than to themselves a fourth reason but this is not such a good one as the other three is that the opera upon which this book is founded is unhappily not played in every town every night of the year it should be of course but it is not and it may very well happen that some poor people have to go so long as two or three years without having any opportunity of improving their minds by seeing it performed when we get a national theatre at which all the best plays will be produced at the expense of the public who will also enjoy the privilege of paying to see the plays after they have defrayed the cost of uh, producing them her majesty's ship pinafore will no doubt be played once or twice in every fortnight forever but as some years must elapse before this happy state of things can come to pass and as those who are very young ladies and gentlemen now may be very middle-aged ladies and gentlemen then it is thought that it would be a kind and considerate action to supply them at once with a story of the play so as not to subject them to the tantalizing annoyance of having to wait possibly many years before they have an opportunity of learning what it is all about as i would not for the world deceive my young readers i think it right to state that this story is entirely imaginary it might very well have happened but in point of fact it never did w s gilbert end of preface chapter one great britain is at present the most powerful maritime country in the world she possesses a magnificent fleet superb officers and splendid seamen and one and all are actuated by an intense desire to maintain their country's reputation in its highest glory one of the finest and most perfectly manned ships in that magnificent fleet was her majesty's ship pinafore and i call the ship her majesty's because she belonged to good queen victoria's time when men of war were beautiful objects to look at with tall tapering masts broad white sails and gracefully designed hulls and not huge slate-coloured iron tanks without masts and sails as they are to-day she was commanded by captain corcoran r n a very humane gallant and distinguished officer who did everything in his power to make his crew happy and comfortable he had a sweet light baritone voice and an excellent ear for music of which he was extremely fond and this led him to sing to his crew pretty songs of his own composition and to teach them to sing to him to encourage this taste among his crew he made it a rule on board that nobody should ever say anything to him that could possibly be sung 
a rule that was only relaxed when a heavy gale was blowing or when he had a bilious headache harmless improving books were provided for the crew to read and vanilla ices sugar plums hardbake and raspberry jam were served out every day with a liberal hand in short he did everything possible consistently with his duty to her majesty to make everybody on board thoroughly ill and happy captain corcoran was a widower with one daughter named josephine a beautiful young lady with whom every single gentleman who saw her fell head over ears in love she was tall exquisitely graceful with the loveliest blue eyes and barley sugar coloured hair ever seen out of a pantomime but her most attractive feature was perhaps her nose which was neither too long nor too short nor too narrow nor too broad nor too straight it had the slightest possible touch of sauciness in it but only just enough to let people know that though she could be funny if she pleased her fun was always gentle and refined and never under any circumstances tended in the direction of unfeeling practical jokes it was such a maddening little nose and had so extraordinary an effect on the world at large that whenever she went into society she found it necessary to wear a large pasteboard artificial nose of so unbecoming and ridiculous a description that people passed her without taking the smallest notice of her this alone is enough to show what a kind-hearted and self-sacrificing girl was the beautiful josephine corcoran one of the smartest sailors on board her majesty's ship pinafore was a young fellow called ralph rackstraw though as will be seen presently that was not his real name he was extremely good-looking and considering that he had had very little education remarkably well spoken unhappily he had got it into his silly head that a british man-of-war's man was a much finer fellow than he really is he is no doubt a very fine fellow indeed but perhaps not quite so fine a fellow as ralph rackstraw thought he was he had heard a great many songs and sentiments in which a british tar was described as a person who possessed every good quality that could be packed into one individual whereas there is generally room for a great many more good qualities than are usually found inside any sailor a good packer never packs anything too tight it is always judicious to leave room for unexpected odds and ends and british tars are very good packers and leave plenty of room for any newly acquired virtues that may be coming along so although ralph had gathered up many excellent qualities there were still some that he had not yet added to his collection and among these was a proper appreciation of the fact that he hadn't got them all in short his only fault was a belief that he hadn't any ralph rackstraw was one of the many who loved josephine to distraction nearly all the unmarried members of the crew also loved josephine but they were older and more sensible than ralph and clearly understood that they could never be accepted as suitable husbands for a beautiful young lady of position who was moreover their own captain's daughter they knew that their manners were quite unsuited to polite dining and drawing-rooms and indeed they would have been very uncomfortable if they had been required to sit at table with gentlemen in gold epaulets and ladies in feathers and long trains so they very wisely reasoned themselves into a conviction that the sooner they put josephine out of their heads the better it would be for their peace of mind there is a time between four and six in the afternoon when the men-of-war sailors are allowed to cease their work and amuse themselves with cheerful songs and rational conversation it is called the dog watch why i can't imagine and at that time all who are not engaged upon any special duty meet on the forecastle which is the front part of the upper deck to sing pretty songs and tell each other those harmless but surprising anecdotes which are known in the royal navy as yarns 
one of the most popular subjects of conversation during the dog watch on board the pinafore was the kindness and consideration shown by their good captain corcoran towards the men under his command and another was the agreeable fact that the pinafore was one of those jolly ships that never pitched and rolled and consequently never made any of the sailors seasick the crew who had been carefully trained by captain corcoran to sing more or less in tune always opened the dog watch with this chorus we sail the ocean blue and our saucy ships a beauty we're sober men and true and attentive to our duty when the balls whistle free o'er the bright blue sea we stand to our gun all day when at anchor we ride on the portsmouth tide we've plenty of time to play this they used to sing as they sipped their ices and ate their root cakes and almond toffee the song might strike you at first as rather too complimentary to themselves but it was not really so as each man who sang it was alluding to all the others and left himself out of the question and so it came to pass that every man paid a pretty compliment to his neighbours and received one in return which was quite fair and led to no quarrelling as the sailors sat and talked they were joined by a rather stout but very interesting elderly woman of striking personal appearance she was what is called a bumboat woman that is to say a person who supplied the officers and crew with little luxuries not included in the ship's bill of fare her real name was paul pineapple but the crew nicknamed her little buttercup partly because it is a pretty name but principally because she was not at all like a buttercup or indeed anything else than a stout quick-tempered and rather mysterious lady with a red face and black eyebrows like leeches and who seemed to know something unpleasant about everybody on board she had a habit of making quite nice people uncomfortable by hinting things in a vague way and at the same time with so much meaning by skilful use of her heavy black eyebrows that they began to wonder whether they hadn't done something dreadful at some time or other and forgotten all about it so little buttercup was not really popular with the crew but they were much too kind-hearted to let her know it little buttercup had a song of her own which she always sang when she came on board here it is i'm called little buttercup dear little buttercup though i could never tell why but still i'm called buttercup poor little buttercup sweet little buttercup i i've snuff and tobacco and excellent jacky i've scissors and watches and knives i've ribbons and laces to set off the faces of pretty young sweethearts and wives i've treacle and toffee and very good coffee soft tommy and rice mutton chops i've chickens and conies and dainty polonies and excellent peppermint drops then buy of your buttercup dear little buttercup sailors should never be shy so buy of your buttercup poor little buttercup come of your buttercup bye thank goodness that's over whispered the sailors to each other with an air of relief you see little buttercup always sang that song whenever she came on board and after a few months people got tired of it besides not being really popular on account of her aggravating tongue she sold for the most part things that the liberal captain provided freely for his crew out of his own pocket money they had soup fish an entree a joint an apple pudding or a jam tart every day besides eggs and ham for breakfast muffins for tea and as many scissors pocket knives and cigars as they chose to ask for so little buttercup was not even useful to them and they only tolerated her because they were gallant british tars who couldn't be rude to a lady if they tried 
in point of fact they had tried on several occasions to say rude and unpleasant things to ladies but as they had invariably failed in the attempt they at last gave it up as hopeless and determined to be quietly polite under all possible circumstances so they asked her to sit down and take a strawberry ice and a wafer which she did rather sulkily as no one seemed to want any of the things she had to sell tell us a story little buttercup said bill bobstay bill was a boatswain's mate who besides being busily occupied in embroidering his name in red worsted on a canvas nighty case generally took the lead in all the amusements of the dog watch you can if you try i'm sure miss you're quite right said little buttercup i could tell you stories about yourselves which would make you all wish you had never been born i know who takes sugar plums to bed with them looking at one and who doesn't say his prayers looking at another and who sucks his thumb in his hammock looking at the third and who makes ugly faces at his captain when his back's turned looking at a fourth and who does his front hair with patent curlers looking at a fifth and who puts raspberry jam into his messmate's boots looking at a sixth all the sailors referred to looked very hot and uncomfortable for their consciences told them that little buttercup had hit off their various weaknesses with surprising accuracy let's change the subject said bill bobstay he was the one who ate sugar plums in bed we all have our faults but after all we're not so bad as poor dick deadeye that's one comfort now this was very unjust on the part of mr bobstay dick deadeye who sat apart from the others busy manicuring his nails was one of the ugliest persons who ever entered the navy his face had been so knocked about and burnt and scarred in various battles and from falling down from aloft that not one feature was in its proper place the wags among the crew pretended that his two eyes his nose and his mouth had been playing a puss in the corner and that his left eye having been unable to find a corner that was unoccupied was consequently left in the middle of course this was only their nonsense but it shows what a very plain man he must have been he was hump-backed and bandy-legged and round-shouldered and hollow-chested and severely pitted with smallpox marks he had broken both his arms both his legs his two collar-bones and all his ribs and looked just as if he had been crumpled up in the hand of some enormous giant he ought properly to have been made a greenwich pensioner long ago but captain corcoran was too kind-hearted to hint that dick deadeye was deformed and so he was allowed to continue to serve his country as a man of warsman as best he could now dick deadeye was generally disliked because he was so unpleasant to look at but he was really one of the best and kindest and most sensible men on board the pinafore and this shows how wrong and unjust it is to judge unfavorably of a man because he is ugly and deformed i myself am one of the plainest men i've ever met and at the same time i don't know a more agreeable old gentleman but so strong was the prejudice against poor dick deadeye that nothing he could say or do appeared to be right the worst construction was placed upon his most innocent remarks and his noblest sentiments were always attributed to some unworthy motive they had no idea what the motive was but they felt sure there was a motive and that he ought to be ashamed of it dick deadeye sighed sadly when mr bobstay spoke so disparagingly of him he wiped a tear from his eye as soon as he'd found that organ and then continued to manicure his poor old cracked and broken nails in silence what's the matter with the man said little buttercup isn't he well ay ay lady said dick i'm as well as ever i shall be but i am ugly ain't i well said little buttercup you are certainly uh, plain and i'm three-cornered ain't i said he you are rather triangular aha said dick laughing bitterly that's it i'm ugly and they hate me for it 
bill bobstay was sorry he had spoken so unkindly well dick said he putting down his embroidery we wouldn't go to hurt any fellow creature's feelings but setting personal appearance on one side you can't expect a person with such a name as dick deadeye to be a popular character now can you no said dick sadly it's acting too much it's human nature and i don't complain at this moment a beautiful tenor voice was heard singing up in the rigging the nightingale loved the pale moon's bright ray and told his tale in his own melodious way he sang ah well a day the lowly vale for the mountain vainly sighed to his humble wail the echoing hills replied they sang ah well a day who is the silly cuckoo who is tweetling up aloft asked little buttercup rather rudely as she scooped up the last drops of her eyes that said bob say why that's only poor rafe rackstraw who's in love with miss josephine rafe rackstraw exclaimed little buttercup ah i could tell you a good deal about him if i chose but i won't not yet at this point rafe descended the rigging and joined his messmates on deck ah my lad said one of them you're quite right to come down for you've climbed too high our worthy captain's child won't have anything to say to a poor chap like you all the sailors said here here and nodded their heads simultaneously like so many china mandarins in a tea-shop oh no no said dick did i captain's daughters don't marry common sailors now this was a very sensible remark but coming from ugly dick deadeye it was considered to be in the worst possible taste all the sailors muttered shame shame dick deadeye said bob stay those sentiments of yours are a disgrace to our common nature dick shrugged his left eyebrow he would have shrugged his shoulders if he could but they wouldn't work that way so always anxious to please he did the best he could with his left eyebrow but even that didn't succeed in conciliating his messmates. "'It's very strange,' said Rafe, "'that the daughter of a man who hails from the quarter-deck "'may not love another who lays out on the foyard arm. "'For a man is but a man, "'whether he hoists his flag at the main truck "'or his slacks on the main deck.' "'This speech of Rafe's calls for a little explanation, "'for he expressed himself in terms "'which an ordinary landsman would not understand. "'The quarter-deck is the part of the ship reserved for officers, "'and the foreyard arm is a horizontal spar "'with a sail attached to it, "'and which crosses the front mast of a ship, "'and sailors are said to lay out on it "'when they get on to it for the purpose "'of increasing or reducing sail.' then again the main truck is the very highest point of the middle mast and it is from that point that the captain flies his flag while a sailor is said to hoist his slacks when he hitches up the waistband of his trousers to keep them in their proper place now you know all about that ah said dick deadeye it's a queer world dick dead i said mr bobstay i have no desire to press hardly on any human being but such a wicked sentiment is enough to make an honest sailor shudder and all his messmates began to shudder violently to show what honest sailors they were and how truly bobstay had spoken but at that moment the ship's bell sounding four strokes gave them notice that the dog watch had come to an end so the crew put away their manicure boxes and embroidered nighty cases and dispersed to their several duties End of chapter one chapter two one of the most important personages in the government of that day was sir joseph porter the first lord of the admiralty you would naturally think that the person who commanded the entire navy would be the most accomplished sailor who could be found but that is not the way in which such things are managed in england sir joseph porter who had risen from a very humble position to be a lawyer and then a member of parliament was i believe the only man in england who knew nothing whatever about ships 
now as england is a great maritime country it is very important that all englishmen should understand something about men of war so as soon as it was discovered that his ignorance of a ship was so complete that he didn't know one end of it from the other some important person said let us set this poor ignorant gentleman to command the british fleet and by that means give him an opportunity of ascertaining what a ship really is this was considered to be a most wise and sensible suggestion and so sir joseph porter was at once appointed first lord of the admiralty of great britain and ireland i dare say you think i am joking but indeed i am quite serious that is the way in which things are managed in this great and happy country now sir joseph porter was one of the many people who having accidentally seen her without her nose had fallen a victim to the extraordinary beauty of miss josephine corcoran he quite recognized the fact that his position as first lord of the admiralty of this mighty country rendered it undesirable that he should marry so obscure a lady as the daughter of a mere captain in the navy but josephine's charm was so overpowering that he determined to put his pride in his pocket and condescend to bestow his hand upon her so one day he announced to captain corcoran that it was his intention to visit her majesty's ship pinafore in order to propose for his daughter's hand now most people would think that josephine would have gladly accepted so great a man as sir joseph but it so happened that that young lady was not at all impressed by the honour which he proposed to confer upon her she did not object to him personally indeed she had never seen him but she was a girl of spirit with a will of her own and had no idea of being handed over without her consent to any gentleman however important a person he might be moreover and this was a profound secret she had been greatly struck with the many good qualities of rafe rackstraw who never lost a chance of distinguishing himself in her eyes whenever he saw her looking in his direction he assumed a series of the most graceful and captivating attitudes ever seen and josephine was never tired of watching him as he gradually moved from one beautiful pose to another each more graceful and more truly artistic than the last his lovely tenor voice also charmed her greatly and his performances on a penny jew's harp appeared to her to excel any music that the most expensive instruments could produce at the same time she was much too proud and too well behaved to allow rafe to know that she admired him so it was a secret between her and herself and neither was so dishonourable as to violate the other's confidence on the eventful morning of sir joseph's intended visit captain corcoran came on deck as soon as he had finished his breakfast captain corcoran had arranged a pretty little musical method of greeting his crew and the crew practised it with him until they were perfect this was how he greeted his crew every day my gallant crew good morning and they would reply sir good morning then he would say i hope you're all quite well and they would answer quite well and you sir and he would reply i am in reasonable health and happy to see you all once more and they would sing you do us proud sir of course when he was not quite well he would alter the words to suit his condition like this i have a dreadful toothache yet i'm happy to see you all once more or i have a housemaid's knee yet i am happy to see you all once more and so forth for captain corcoran never intentionally said anything that was not strictly true after this introduction he used to tell them something about himself the captain i am the captain of the pinafore the crew and a right good captain too the captain politely you're very very good and be it understood i command a right good crew the crew to each other we're very very good and be it understood he commands a right good crew the captain though related to a peer i can stand reef and steer and guide a selvagee i am never known to quail at the fury of a gale and i'm never never sick at sea the crew who know better 
what never the captain mere forgetfulness no never the crew who remember one instance what never the captain who now recollects the occasion they are referring to hardly ever the crew delighted at having caught him tripping he's hardly ever sick at sea then give three cheers and one cheer more for the hardy captain of the pinafore the captain i do my best to satisfy you all the crew and with you were quite content the captain you're exceedingly polite and i think it only right to return the compliment the crew to each other were exceedingly polite and he thinks it only right to return the compliment the captain bad language or abuse i never never use whatever the emergency how tiresome i may occasionally say but i never use a big big b the crew who remember a certain occasion what never the captain the circumstance had slipped his memory uh, no never the crew who don't mean to let him off what never the captain the incident suddenly occurring to him hardly ever the crew who have scored hardly ever says a big big b then give three cheers and one cheer more for the well-bred captain of the pinafore and they gave three of the heartiest cheers you ever heard after this pretty little ceremony which might with advantage be more generally adopted throughout the navy the officers and sailors employed themselves with a variety of easy little tasks suited to rather lazy people on a very fine warm day captain corcoran who was never idle was about to retire to his cabin to arrange the figures of a minuet which he intended to teach his men to dance when his attention was arrested by josephine who at that moment came on deck the poor young lady was very sad and sang a remarkably beautiful song of her own composition it ran like this sorry her lot who loves too well heavy the heart that hopes but vainly sad are the sighs that own the spell uttered by eyes that speak too plainly heavy the sorrow that bows the head when love is alive and hope is dead the good captain was distressed to see his dear daughter in this bilious frame of mind my child said he i grieve to see that you are a prey to melancholy there's another verse papa said josephine who rather resented interruption don't sing it my child your music depresses us both i want you to look your best to-day for sir joseph porter will arrive presently to claim your promised hand nay father said josephine i can esteem reverence even venerate sir joseph for i shouldn't be surprised if he is a great and good man but i cannot love him for alas my heart is given given exclaimed her father and to whom not to some gilded lordling no papa said she the object of my affection is no lordling oh pity me for he is but a humble sailor on board your own ship impossible said captain corcoran yet it is true replied josephine too true a common sailor exclaimed the captain oh fie i quite feel the fie said she but he's anything but common come my child said her father let us talk this over in a matter of the heart i would not control my daughter i attach little value to rank or wealth but the line must be drawn somewhere a man in that lowly station may be brave and worthy but at every step he would make dreadful blunders that society would never pardon he would drop his h's and eat peas with his knife captain corcoran's sentiments upon this point were so right and just that one is more sorry than ever that he should have boasted in his song of being related to a peer it is just one of those unfortunate little slips that one never can quite get out of one's mind personally i hope he did it only because he wanted to rhyme to steer but after all that's a very poor excuse all that you say is true replied josephine but fear not papa i have a heart and therefore i love but i am your daughter and therefore i am proud 
though i carry my love with me to the tomb he shall never never know it poor girl she thought so at the time but as the result will show she sadly overestimated her strength of mind and the consequence was a pretty kettle of fish i promise you at this point a message was brought to the captain by lieutenant hatchway that the ship's barge was approaching with sir joseph on board accompanied by his two plain sisters his three ugly aunts and ever so many pretty cousins their daughters sir joseph was a gentleman of great refinement who was very easily shocked and as he knew that the society of charming ladies had the effect of making everybody polite and considerate he never travelled any great distance without them pipe the side and man the ship said the captain which meant that he wished all the officers to stand in a row to salute the first lord and all the crew to stand upright on the various spars that crossed the three masts which is the way in which superior persons were always received on a man of war the captain of marines who are a kind of military sailors or nautical soldiers brought up his men that they might present arms with their rifles at the word of command and the ship's band were ready with all their instruments to play god save the queen at the proper moment all these preparations were ready by the time the ship's barge which is a very large and handsome boat rowed by twelve sailors seated two and two was alongside and in a few moments sir joseph porter and his female relations stepped on board the officers saluted the marines presented arms the drums rattled the band struck up the national anthem and nine-pounder drums were fired from the middle deck sir joseph who was quite as fond of music as captain corcoran had composed these remarkable verses which he always sang whenever he went on board a man-of-war sir joseph i'm the monarch of the sea the ruler of the queen's navy whose praise great britain loudly chaunts and the ladies sang and we are his sisters and his cousins and his aunts sir joseph when at anchor here i ride my bosom swells with pride and i snap my fingers at a foeman's taunts all the ladies and so do his sisters and his cousins and his aunts sir joseph but when the breezes blow i generally go below and seek the seclusion that a cabin grants all the ladies and so do his sisters and his cousins and his aunts his sisters and his cousins whom he reckons up by dozens and his aunts then sir joseph who was proud of his lowly origin and who thought that a short sketch of his career would afford a useful example to ambitious persons in a humble rank of life was so good as to sing the following song when i was a lad i served a term as office boy in an attorney's firm i cleaned the windows and i swept the floor and i polished up the handle of the big front door i polished up that handle so successfully that now i am the ruler of the queen's navy as office boy i made such a mark that they gave me the post of a junior clerk i served the writs with a smile so bland and i copied all the letters in a big round hand and i copied all the letters in a hand so free that now i am the ruler of the queen's navy in serving writs i made such a name that an article clerk i soon became i wore clean collars and a brand new suit for the pass examination at the institute that pass examination did so well for me that now i am the ruler of the queen's navy of legal knowledge i acquired such a grip that they took me into partnership and that junior partnership i ween was the only ship that i had ever seen but that same ship so suited me that now i am the ruler of the queen's navy i grew so rich that i was sent to the house as a member of parliament i always voted at my party's call and i never thought of thinking for myself at all i thought so little they rewarded me by making me the ruler of the queen's navy now landsmen all whoever you may be if you want to rise to the top of the tree if your soul isn't fettered to an office stool be careful to be guided by this golden rule stick close to your desks and never go to sea and you all may be rulers of the queen's navy between ourselves i think this last suggestion was rather silly for he was addressing people who had already gone to sea and consequently could not possibly act on his advice 
but i'm afraid that sir joseph though a very distinguished man was like a good many other very distinguished men a bit of a goose you've a remarkably fine crew captain corcoran said sir joseph when he had finished his song and was quite sure that they didn't want him to sing it again it is a fine crew said captain corcoran i hope you treat them kindly captain corcoran indeed i hope so sir joseph no bullying i trust no strong language of any kind oh never sir joseph what never said sir joseph who had heard rumours to the contrary the captain's eye met those of some of his crew who shook their fingers significantly at him well hardly ever said the captain they are an excellent crew and do their work thoroughly without it sir joseph was one of those people whom it is extremely difficult to satisfy for you never quite knew whether what you said would please him or make him angry and it generally did the latter he was very fond of popularity and as there were five hundred sailors on board the pinafore and only one captain he thought it a good plan to snub the captain in order to make friends of the crew it is true that he was in love with the captain's daughter but he felt sure that the captain was so anxious to have such a great and powerful man as the first lord of the admiralty for a son-in-law that a few snubs more or less might be safely indulged in so when captain corcoran praised his crew so highly sir joseph porter said to him very angrily don't patronize them sir that you are their captain is a mere accident of birth i cannot permit these noble fellows to be patronized because an accident of birth has placed you above them and them below you poor captain corcoran turned very red and felt extremely tingly down the back at being so publicly rebuked it is always a mistake to rebuke people in the presence of those who have to obey them if it can possibly be avoided i am the last person to insult a british sailor sir joseph said he you are the last person who did said sir joseph snappishly i feel quite sorry for captain corcoran who really meant as well as possible he was a much truer gentleman than sir joseph though i can't quite forget that unfortunate remark of his about being related to a peer during this conversation ralph rackstraw had assumed in succession several of his choicest attitudes and these naturally attracted sir joseph's attention captain corcoran said he desire that splendid seaman to step forward rakestraw said the captain three paces to the front march sir joseph pretended to be greatly shocked at this abrupt command if what said sir joseph very sternly the captain was puzzled i beg your pardon said he i don't quite understand if you please said sir joseph with a very strong emphasis on the please now it is not usual in the navy to say if you please whenever you give an order it would take up too much time but captain corcoran was bound to obey the great man though you will observe that the great man never said if you please when he addressed captain corcoran the captain looking as if he had just bitten a pill said uh, oh yes uh, of course if you please and accordingly ralph rackstraw took three paces to the front and if ever a captain in the navy said bother under his breath captain corcoran was that man you're a remarkably fine fellow said sir joseph addressing ralph yes your honour replied ralph who was too well acquainted with his duty to presume to differ from the first lord of the admiralty and a first-rate seaman i'll be bound there's not a smarter sailor in the navy your honour said ralph though i say it who shouldn't this sounds rather conceited of ralph but he had learnt from captain corcoran to speak the exact truth on all occasions besides he wanted to convince sir joseph how right he was in the opinion he had formed now tell me rafe don't be afraid how does your captain treat you a better captain don't walk the deck your honour and all the rest of the crew said here here this was not quite what sir joseph wanted he would rather that rafe had said well he does his best poor chap or something of that half complimentary kind 
however he managed to conceal his disappointment a good said he i i like to think you speak well of your commanding officer i dare say he doesn't deserve it but it does you credit now captain corcoran a word with you in private certainly sir joseph replied the captain boatswain said he turning towards mr bobstay in commemoration of sir joseph's visit see that an extra tub of raspberry jam is served out to the ship's company beg pardon said mr bobstay who hadn't forgotten sir joseph's lesson in politeness if what your honour captain corcoran could scarcely believe his ears if what said he i don't i really don't think i understand you if you please your honour the captain looked thunderstruck when sir joseph interposed the gentleman is quite right if you please the captain had almost let out another bother but he gulped it down with a great effort if you please said he and sir joseph entered the cabin with captain corcoran followed by his two plain sisters his three ugly aunts and all his pretty cousins refreshments had thoughtfully been provided for them in the wardroom which is the apartment assigned to the lieutenants on board a man-of-war and they enjoyed a delightful luncheon in the agreeable society of the junior officers in gilt buttons and gold epaulets who paid even more attention to sir joseph's plain sisters and ugly aunts than they did to his younger and more attractive relations which shows what thoroughly well-bred gentlemen british naval officers are plain elderly people are just as hungry as young and pretty ones and nobody ought to make any distinction between them while sir joseph communicated his matrimonial intentions at great length to captain corcoran in his private cabin the crew broke up and withdrew to the forecastle to discuss the events of the morning ah said mr busby sir joseph's a true gentleman courteous and considerate to the very humblest well spoke well spoke they all cried they should have said spoken and would have done so if their education had been properly attended to you see these poor ignorant sailors were not shrewd enough to understand that sir joseph had his reasons for flattering them so outrageously he longed for popularity and determined to acquire it at any price and it is quite clear that as far as the crew of the pinafore was concerned he had fully achieved his object old ard said another of the crew bill bowling by name we are not as humble as all that sir joseph has explained our true position to us and if he says that a british sailor is any man's equal why it's our duty to believe him oh, that's right enough muttered all the sailors except dick deadeye who knew better you're on the wrong tack said he and so sir joseph he means well but he don't know when people have to obey other people's orders equality's out of the question i really believe that if the crew had not been restrained by humane consideration they would have pulled dick deadeye's hair dick deadeye said mr bobstay if you go for to infuriate this here ship's crew too far i won't answer for being able to hold em in i'm shocked that's what i am shocked messmates said rafe who had been greatly impressed by what sir joseph had said my mind's made up i'll speak to the captain's daughter and tell her like an honest man of the honest love i have for her the crew cheered loudly is not my love as good as another's continued rafe is not my heart as true as another's have i not hands and eyes and ears and limbs like another you've got as pretty an outfit of them useful articles as any man on board said mr bobstay true said rafe rather despondently i lack birth here bill bowling interfered with a rather silly joke not a bit of it said bill you've got a berth on board this very ship well said replied rafe who sailor-like jumped at any argument however ridiculous that he thought would help his case i had forgotten that messmate don't you approve my determination there was a general murmur of ay ay we do and right you are i don't no i do not of course it was dick deadeye who said this bill bobstay was in despair 
what's to be done with this here hopeless chap said he suppose we sing him the official admirably song that sir joseph wrote and caused to be distributed through the fleet it may bring this here miserable creature to a proper state of mind ralph gave the keynote on his jew's harp and they all struck up in chorus notwithstanding ralph's thoughtful precaution they began on seven different notes but by the time they had finished the third line they had wobbled into something like an agreement as to the key in which it was to be sung a british tar is a soaring soul as free as a mountain bird his energetic fist should be ready to resist a dictatorial word his nose should pant and his lips should curl his cheeks should flame and his brow should furl his bosom should heave and his heart should glow and his fist be ever ready for a knock-down blow his eye should flash with an inborn fire his brow with scorn be wrung he never should bow down to a domineering frown or the tang of a tyrant tongue his foot should stamp and his throat should growl his hair should twirl and his face should scowl his eyes should flash and his chest protrude and this should be his customary attitude as they sang the last line they all except ralph assumed fighting attitudes as if they were inviting the whole world to come on ralph stood apart in the pose of ajax defying the lightning for it was his strict rule to assume classical attitudes only End of chapter two chapter three the wardroom lunch was finished and all the ladies were playing bridge for nuts with the officers except josephine whose thoughts were too much occupied with other and more important matters so she came on deck to indulge in a reverie all alone it is useless said she to herself sir joseph's attentions disgust me i know that he is a truly great and good man for he told me so himself and of course he would know but to me he seems tedious fretful and dictatorial yet his must be a mind of no common order or he would not dare to teach my dear father to dance a hornpipe on the cabin table it was sir joseph's firm belief that if great britain were to retain her proud position as the most powerful naval country in the world it was essential that all her sailors should learn to dance hornpipes it was all he knew about the navy and he had been three years learning that as josephine soliloquized she saw ralph rackstraw advancing towards her with an undulating swan-like motion that teemed with unspeakable grace rafe rackstraw she exclaimed withdrawing from her pocket the false nose which she always put on when she thought she was going to be too much admired nay lady said he put away yon pasteboard mockery the matchless beauty of the real one is so deeply graven in my memory that i can see it even through that hollow absurdity in that case said she it is of course useless to wear it for it is uncomfortable wear on a warm day and she returned it to her pocket lady said ralph i have long wished to meet you alone that's nonsense she replied you can't be alone if i am here you know an unworthy quibble said he you know perfectly well what i mean it is unladylike to sneer at a poor sailor man because his education has been neglected it is true she replied i beg your pardon granted said he with the ready urbanity of one of nature's noblemen poor josephine was much touched by this generous and freely accorded forgiveness and the affection that she had long entertained for him struggled with her sense that it would never do to unite herself with the humble and illiterate sailor moreover she had promised her papa that no consideration would induce her to let ralph rackstraw know her real sentiments towards him so she drew a diabolo from her pocket and pretended to be wholly absorbed in the game she usually played it with great skill throwing the diabolo as high as the masthead and catching it on the string with her eyes shut but so great was her agitation that she missed it every time to the serious damage of her renowned nose nay lady said ralph i see that my presence has unsettled you i will withdraw 
no ralph you may remain she said she did not like him to go away with the impression that she was but a clumsy player after all and again she tossed the diabolo high into the air and again it came down on her beautiful little nose lady said he put aside that silly toy and listen i am a poor uneducated fellow who has dared to love you but before you dismiss me with contempt do not forget that i am a british sailor it is important to bear that in mind josephine was much moved and though she was a girl of great strength of mind she would not trust herself to speak so she merely exclaimed pooh and again threw up the toy with the same painful results nay lady said he i feel that this indifference is assumed i distinctly see a tear trembling in your left eye it it was the diabolo she said not quite truthfully it hurt then you reject me said he sir said she you forget the disparity in our ranks i forget nothing haughty girl said ralph give me hope and what i lack in education and polite accomplishments i will endeavour to acquire drive me to despair and in death alone i shall look for consolation i am proud and cannot stoop to implore i have spoken and i await your word as he finished he assumed an attitude of such extraordinary dignity that josephine was on the point of saying take me and be happy but the noble girl called all her resolution to her aid and haughtily replied you shall not wait long your proffered love i contemptuously reject go sir and learn to cast your eyes on some village maiden in your own poor rank they should be lowered before your captain's daughter and so saying with the tell-tale tears streaming down her face she strode magnificently to her cabin where she almost sobbed her little heart out poor josephine ralph rackstraw was furious in defiance of all ship's rules he loudly summoned all the crew to the quarter-deck why what's all this said mr bobstay is the ship on fire or have they made you port admiral neither gasped ralph i have told josephine of my love and she has scornfully rejected me ah what did i tell you said the crew as one man well ralph said bobstay i was afraid you were over sanguine ay ay said dick did i it was too much to expect will somebody please take this chap away and put his head in the flour bin said mr bobstay his sentiments are simply disgraceful and two brawny sailors took poor dick away kicking meekly and dipped his head into the flour bin until he assured them that he would behave better in future life is no longer worth living said ralph has anybody got such a thing as a pistol handy mr bobstay was overcome with emotion for he loved ralph rather better than his own mother and the crew quite unmanned sobbed on each other's shoulders come said ralph a pistol mr bobstay who was one of the most tender-hearted creatures living could never refuse anything to the friend of his heart so the good fellow reluctantly produced a full-sized horse pistol and proceeded to load it as quickly as his hiccuping sobs would allow him while ralph was taking an affectionate leave of his beloved shipmates here you are ralph he said handing him the loaded pistol bless you my boy be cool and aim straight it'll soon be over and the brawny seaman fairly sobbed like a girl my friend said ralph for the last time farewell and when i am dead convey my respectful compliments to miss josephine and tell her that she's done it and i hope she likes it so saying he placed the pistol to his head while all the crew stopped their ears for if there was one thing they hated more than another it was the bang of an exploding firearm but you will be surprised to hear that ralph was not to die just then josephine who had been watching all this through her cabin window which looked on to the quarter-deck couldn't stand it any longer forgetting her family pride her brilliant prospects and even her promise to her papa she rushed out and flung herself into ralph's arms with a shriek in which devoted love acute anguish humbled pride wild determination and maidenly reserve 
were perceptibly blended she had often practised this shriek so as to have it ready for emergencies and it was much admired by her family and friends rafe visibly moved flung away the pistol which exploded as it fell making all the crew jump and cutting off poor dead eyes only remaining little toe rafe embraced josephine rapturously as the crew danced shouted and flung up their caps for very joy it was arranged that the happy pair accompanied by the ship's company should steal away that very night at twelve in order to be married without a moment's delay and as they all knew a chorus which happened to fit the situation exactly they sung it as loud as they could let's give three cheers for the sailor's bride who casts all thoughts of rank aside who gives up home and fortune too for the honest love of a sailor true all this time sir joseph in the captain's cabin was so busily occupied in explaining to captain corcoran at great length how tremendous a sacrifice he was making in condescending to marry josephine and the captain was listening to him so attentively that neither of them heard anything of the noisy rejoicings i have just described End of chapter three chapter four it was night and a beautiful crescent moon was shining over the placid blue waters of portsmouth harbour all the hammocks had been taken from the receptacles on deck called hammock nettings in which they were kept during the day carried below and hung up from hooks in the beams of the lower decks the sailors who were not required on deck were supposed to be fast asleep in them but i'm afraid they slept with one eye open because it would soon be time for them to escape secretly from the ship in order to accompany rafe rackstraw and the beautiful josephine to portsmouth town to be married josephine did not go to bed at all but was busily occupied in packing up a few indispensable necessaries not forgetting her pasteboard nose in a small handbag and in writing an affectionate farewell letter to her kind papa now i want it to be distinctly understood that josephine was very much to be blamed for the step she was about to take in the first place a young lady should under no circumstances fall in love with a young man greatly beneath her in social rank and in the second place no young lady should ever take such an important step as getting married without her papa's express approval in this case josephine had distinctly promised her papa that she would never under any circumstances let rafe rackstraw know even that she had fallen in love with him whereas here she was actually preparing to leave the ship with him secretly in order that they might be married it is true that it is some excuse for her that she revealed her affection for rafe as the only means of preventing him from killing himself but having done that she should have gone to her papa without a moment's delay and explained to him the dreadful circumstances under which she had felt bound to disclose her secret captain corcoran had shown himself to be a most affectionate and sympathetic father and he would no doubt have made every allowance for the distressing situation in which she found herself he might even have gone so far and i think he would as to have provided masters for rafe who would have taught him to spell and dance drink soup without gobbling eat peas with a fork play bridge and in short make him fit to take his place creditably among ladies and gentlemen poor captain corcoran had also been greatly worried by the events of the day he had been severely rebuked by sir joseph in the presence of his crew for not having said if you please when he gave them an order he had been greatly upset by his daughter's determination to decline sir joseph's handsome offer and also by her short and snappish replies to sir joseph's pretty speeches at dinner that evening and to crown everything sir joseph had threatened to have him placed under arrest and tried by court-martial because he did not rebuke josephine for her rudeness to him at dinner of course if the first lord of the admiralty had known anything whatever about the navy he would have been aware that no court-martial would have punished captain corcoran for his daughter's rudeness but he knew nothing at all about the navy having as we know been brought up in a solicitor's office 
so instead of going to bed at his usual hour captain corcoran brought his banjo on deck and began to sing to the moon as sentimental people will do who find themselves in such low spirits that they cannot sleep he had written and composed the song in his cabin after sir joseph had retired to rest and when he had practised it until he knew it by heart he came up on deck to sing it the moon was behind a cloud at the time but as soon as she became aware that a gentleman was going to sing to her she politely blew the cloud aside and listened to hear what he had to say this was the pretty song that he sang fair moon to thee i sing bright regent of the heavens say why is everything either at sixes or sevens i have lived hitherto free from the breath of slander beloved by all my crew a really popular commander but now my kindly crew rebel my daughter to a tar is partial sir joseph storms and sad to tell he threatens a court-martial fair moon to thee i sing bright regent of the heavens say why is everything either at sixes or at sevens the moon not being in the position to give him the required information withdrew behind her cloud and was seen no more captain corcoran had no idea that any one except the moon was listening to him as he sang but in point of fact little buttercup who was concealed by the mizzenmast had heard his beautiful light baritone voice and her attention was arrested by the charm of the dainty melody now i must tell you something about little buttercup who had had a very adventurous career at the time of my story she was a buxom well-preserved person about sixty-five years of age she had known captain corcoran all his life and when he was a handsome young lieutenant of twenty-five i am sorry to say she fell hopelessly in love with him although the old goose was at least twenty years older than he lieutenant corcoran as he was then commanded a little gunboat called the hot cross bun and i should explain that a gunboat in those days was a very small vessel rigged something like a miniature ship and was armed with one two or three big guns lieutenant corcoran was then in the very flower of manly beauty and all the young ladies of portsmouth were quite as much in love with him as little buttercup was of course lieutenant corcoran scarcely noticed little buttercup she used to wash for the ship and he only saw her now and then when she brought his linen aboard at length the hot cross bun was ordered to make ready to go to sea and little buttercup who couldn't bear the thought that she might never see him again dressed herself in sailor's clothes and presented herself on board as a not very young man who wanted to go to sea captain corcoran who as a matter of course did not recognize her in this disguise accepted her as a member of his crew and when the hot cross bun sailed little buttercup sailed with it she was extremely clumsy as a sailor but the kind-hearted lieutenant who couldn't bear to hurt anybody's feelings overlooked her awkwardness in consideration of the eager alacrity with which she endeavored however unsuccessfully to obey all his commands indeed the crew generally were much more remarkable for gentle politeness and cheerful goodwill than for mere pulling and hauling they were without exception most amiable and well-behaved young persons with beautiful complexions very dainty white hands small delicate waists and a great quantity of carefully dressed back hair lieutenant corcoran was bound to admit that as sailor men they were not everything that could be desired being all very seasick when it was not quite calm but in his opinion they more than compensated for this drawback by their singularly polite and refined demeanour when they were quite well one day and it was a terrible day for little buttercup he went on shore for a couple of hours and returned with a beautiful young lady whom he presented to his crew as his newly wedded wife upon which to his intense discomfiture 
all the crew gave a gurgle and fell down in so many separate fainting fits and he then discovered that without a single exception they were portsmouth maidens who had dearly loved him and who had taken the very steps that little buttercup herself had taken in order that they might not be separated from their adored lieutenant of course they were all discharged at once his bride insisted on that and little buttercup did not see him again for twenty long years by this time he had been promoted to be captain of the pinafore his wife had died and he was left a widower with one daughter the beautiful josephine who is the heroine of my story from the moment that little buttercup learnt that lieutenant corcoran was a married man she determined as a matter of course to think of him no more and by a tremendous effort she succeeded in banishing him altogether from her mind but now that he was a widower and again free to marry all her old affection revived by this time as you know she was a bumboat woman and in that capacity she enjoyed many opportunities of seeing and talking to captain corcoran who hadn't the remotest idea that she had formerly been one of the ladylike crew of the hot cross bun and little buttercup never mentioned the circumstance as to tell the plain truth she was not particularly proud of it as the captain sang his song little buttercup wondered what was the matter with him how sweetly he carols forth his melody to the listening moon said she to herself of whom is he thinking of some high-born beauty it may be who is poor little buttercup that she should expect his thoughts to dwell on one so lowly ah little buttercup said captain corcoran as he caught sight of her still on board that is not quite right little one all ladies are requested to go on shore at dusk true dear captain she replied i tried to go but the recollection of your pale and sad face seemed to chain me to the ship i would fain see you smile before i leave i will try said he he endeavoured to smile but it was little more than a creaky mechanical grin not good enough captain replied little buttercup don't be faint-hearted try again because i want to go home again he tried to smile but without success ah little buttercup said he i fear it will be long before i recover my accustomed cheerfulness for misfortunes crowd upon me and all my old friends seem to have turned against me do not say all dear captain exclaimed little buttercup that were unjust to one at least true said captain corcoran for you are staunch to me good old buttercup at this point poor little buttercup's resolution gave way with a bitter cry she knelt at his feet and sobbed loudly as she kissed his hand little buttercup said captain corcoran it would be affectation to pretend that i do not understand your meaning i am touched to the heart by your innocent regard for me and were we differently situated i think i could have returned it as it is i regret to say that i can be nothing to you but a friend little buttercup who always knew more about people than anybody else knew a good deal of captain corcoran's history as will presently appear he was not really captain corcoran and she knew it more than that she knew who he really was but it did not suit her to tell him just then i believe that this mysterious little buttercup was able to prove from the hidden depths of her miscellaneous information that every human being alive was somebody else and that no human being alive was what people really supposed them to be fortunately she only revealed her knowledge bit by bit as it suited her but it is terrible to think what an amount of confusion she might have created in highly respectable families if she had chosen to disclose all she knew at once knowing who captain corcoran was and how little reason he really had to plume himself on his superior position as a captain in the navy little buttercup's naturally hasty temper began to simmer the gypsy blood that ran in her veins gave her a curious power of prophesying backwards i mean that she could foretell what you were and remember what you will be which is quite unlike the usual kind of fortune-telling that comes of crossing a gypsy's hand with a sixpence 
she also possessed a remarkable power of expressing herself in rhyme without ever having to hunt for the last words of her lines which gave a peculiar force and emphasis to her words and convinced everybody that what she said was supernatural and consequently true so getting gradually more and more angry with captain corcoran for despising her as she called it though he was the last person in the world to despise anybody she summoned her remarkable rhyming ability to her aid in the following utterances things are seldom what they seem said she skim milk masquerades as cream high lows pass as patent leathers jackdaws struck in peacock's feathers rhyming is rather infectious so captain corcoran catching the disease replied uh, rather puzzled very true as so they do it was an easy rhyme suited to a mere beginner black sheep dwell in every fold said she all that glitters is not gold storks turn out to be but logs bulls are but inflated frogs the captain thought he could do as well as this but he considered that it was best to confine himself at present to quite easy rhymes so he said so they be uh, frequently buttercup resumed drops the wind and stops the mill turbot is ambitious brill gild the farthing if you will but it is a farthing still the captain replied yes i know that is so then beginning to feel his feet as the saying is he ventured into deeper water though to catch your drift i'm striving it is shady it is shady he repeated it is shady to give him time to think of the next rhyme though he pretended that the repetition was part of the structure of the verse i don't see at what you're driving mystic lady mystic lady having discovered that this sort of rhyming was much easier than it appeared at first sight to be he determined to show her that other people were just as smart as she was and if you come to that even a little bit smarter so he began though i'm anything but clever i could talk like that forever once a cat was killed with care only brave deserved the fare very true so they do said little buttercup mimicking his own way of replying to her the captain continued wink is often good as nod spoils the child who spares the rod thirsty lambs run foxy dangers dogs are found in many mangers here he paused to consider what he should say next and little buttercup to give him time said just as before frequently uh, i agree by this time the captain had thought of something more paw of cat the chestnut snatches worn-out garments show new patches men are grown up catchy catches yes said little buttercup i know that is so then she sang under her breath so that nobody at all should hear her though to catch my drift he's striving i'll dissemble i'll dissemble when he sees at what i'm driving let him tremble let him tremble and muttering to herself in a fashion which might be described musically as a triumph of pianissimo she disappeared mysteriously into the forward part of the ship captain corcoran though very uneasy at her portentous utterances was rather disposed to pat himself on the back for having tackled her on her own ground in the matter of stringing rhymes and as he thought beaten her at it but in this he was wrong for if you compare her lines with his you will see that whereas her lines dealt exclusively with people and things who were not so important as they thought themselves to be his lines were merely chopped up proverbs that had nothing to do with each other or with anything else still it wasn't bad for a first attempt and although we must give her the prize i think he deserves a highly commended now although sir joseph had gone to bed he was so worried about josephine that he couldn't get a wink of sleep so as it was a beautiful warm night and everybody as he supposed asleep he thought he would go on deck in his pyjamas and console himself with a cigar accordingly he went on deck but finding that the captain was in close conversation with a lady he very properly retired to his cabin to put on the beautiful and expensive uniform of a cabinet minister which he had worn during the day 
and which were the only clothes he had brought with him he had completed his toilette and returned to the deck just as captain corcoran was endeavouring to pat himself on the back for his cleverness in stringing rhymes with little buttercup what are you trying to do said sir joseph as he noticed that the captain had some difficulty in reaching the exact part of the back which he wished to pat can i help you uh, thank you sir joseph replied the captain i have a particular reason for wishing to pat myself between the shoulder blades and it's not easy to get at allow me captain corcoran and he obligingly patted him on the very spot thank you sir joseph that is capital said captain corcoran much relieved but i am sorry to see your lordship out of bed at this hour i hope your crib is comfortable pretty well said sir joseph who made it a rule never quite to approve of anything that was done for him the fact is i am worried about your daughter i am disappointed with her to tell the plain truth i don't think she'll do i'm sorry to hear that sir joseph replied the captain josephine is i am sure sensible of your condescension she naturally would be said sir joseph who was really too conceited for words perhaps your exalted rank dazzles her remarked captain corcoran here again we become conscious of that nasty irritating little blot on the good captain's character he attached so much importance to mere rank that i am afraid we must put him down as just a teeny weeny wee bit of a snob do you really think it does asked sir joseph well she is a modest girl and of course her social position is far below that of a cabinet minister possibly she feels that she is not worthy of you captain corcoran knew better than that but his natural kindness of heart would not allow him to tell sir joseph the plain truth that josephine looked upon him as a conceited donkey because he was afraid that being a touchy old gentleman he might not like that that is really a very sensible suggestion said sir joseph see said the captain here she comes if you would kindly reason with her and assure her officially that it is a standing rule at the admiralty that love levels all ranks her respect for an official utterance might induce her to look upon your offer in its proper light it is not unlikely said sir joseph and i am glad i am not wearing my pyjamas let us withdraw and watch our opportunity so they withdrew behind the mast as josephine stepped upon deck poor josephine was very uneasy and conscience-stricken at the unjustifiable step she was going to take that night as the moment for her flight approached she became more and more uncomfortable and as her cabin was hot and the night lovely she thought she would wait more comfortably on deck until the fatal moment for her departure naturally a good and honourable young lady she felt that she was doing an unpardonable thing in leaving her good papa secretly in order to marry a man of whom she knew that he disapproved in common fairness however it should be explained that it was the first time she had ever left her father in order to be secretly married to anybody and she resolved that after this once nothing on earth should ever induce her to do so again josephine had a neat literary turn and it was her practice to express in poetical form the various arguments for and against any important step that she contemplated taking she had amassed quite a large amount of these effusions which she was in the habit of singing on appropriate occasions to any airs that would fit them so finding herself quite alone as she supposed it occurred to her to sing in subdued tones a composition which had direct reference to her misguided affection for ralph this was the song the hours creep on apace my guilty heart is quaking oh that i might retrace the step that i am taking it's folly it were easy to be showing what am i giving up and whither going on the one hand papa's luxurious home hung with ancestral armour and old brasses carved oak and tapestry from distant rome rare blue and white venetian finger glasses rich oriental rugs and sofa pillows and everything that isn't old from gillows 
and on the other a dark dingy room in some back street with stuffy children crying where organs yell and clacking housewives fume and clothes are hanging out all day a-drying with one cracked looking-glass to see your face in and dinner served up in a pudding basin o oh, god of love and god of reason say which of you twain shall my poor heart obey but the two potentates so pathetically appealed to declined to undertake the responsibility of advising her i expect they both thought that she was quite old enough to judge for herself poor josephine was greatly distracted at the ugly prospect of love in a back street that she had conjured up for herself and her resolution began to waver the social difference between her and her chosen husband was so enormous and the discomforts that she would be obliged to endure in the humble surroundings that awaited her presented themselves to her mind so vividly that she had almost resolved that instead of eloping with rafe she would unpack her dressing-bag put her hair up in hind's curlers and go to bed like a good girl i regret to think that in contemplating this step she was influenced solely by the fact that if she married rave she would have to surrender all the luxury she was accustomed to and that remorse for being about to break the heart of her affectionate and indulgent father did not appear to influence her in the least i am very partial to josephine but i cannot regard her in the light of a thoroughly estimable young lady sir joseph endeavoured in vain to catch the words of josephine's song but she had been taught the italian method of singing which consists in la lying all the vowels and allowing the consonants to take care of themselves and consequently the words of her song were quite unintelligible to him indeed they might have been hebrew for anything he could tell so when she had finished he and captain corcoran approached her madam said he it has been represented to me that you are appalled by my exalted rank i desire to convey to you officially my deliberate assurance that if your hesitation is attributable to that circumstance it is unequivocally uncalled for it is a rule at the admiralty that when a person in authority has to make an announcement he is bound to use all the longest words he can find that will express his meaning oh indeed replied josephine then your lordship is of opinion that married happiness is not inconsistent with discrepancy in rank this was artful on josephine's part for if sir joseph agreed he would practically be admitting that there was no reason why josephine should not condescend to marry a common sailor if she had a mind to do so madam said sir joseph loftily i am officially of that opinion and he took a pinch of snuff with an air that suggested that he had finally settled the question once for all i thank you sir joseph she replied with a low curtsey i did hesitate but i will hesitate no longer and with another curtsey she retired to her own cabin muttering to herself he little thinks how successfully he has pleaded his rival's cause the captain who shared sir joseph's impression that josephine had made up her mind to accept him was overjoyed sir joseph said he i cannot express to you my joy at the happy result of your eloquence your argument was unanswerable captain corcoran replied sir joseph it is one of the happiest characteristics of this inexpressibly fortunate country that official replies to respectfully uttered interrogatories are invariably regarded as unanswerable and sir joseph having discharged this mouthful of long words withdrew to complete his night's rest captain corcoran could not conceal his exultation indeed there was no reason why he should as he was entirely alone he clasped his hands smiled broadly took a long breath of relief and had just begun to dance the hornpipe that sir joseph had taught him to see if he remembered the steps when he was interrupted by the unexpected appearance of poor deformed dick deadeye who approached him with the irregular jerky action of a triangle that is being trundled like a hoop captain whispered he i want a word with you and he placed his hand impressively on the captain's wrist 
did i said he you here don't ah don't shrink from me captain replied dead eye i'm unpleasant to look at and my name's agin me but i ain't as bad as i look what do you want with me at this time of night said captain corcoran dead eye looked round mysteriously to make quite sure they were unobserved i've come said he to give you warning indeed exclaimed the captain who was delighted to think that there was a chance of getting rid of dead eye without hurting his feelings do you propose to leave the navy then oh no no said dead eye i don't mean that listen the captain was disappointed but he listened nevertheless and in accordance with the standing rule that no one was ever to say anything to the captain that could be sung dick dead eye struck up as follows kind captain i've important information sing hey the kind commander that you are about a certain intimate relation sing hey the merry maiden and the tar the captain who had his book of rhymes handy consulted it for a moment and then replied good fellow in conundrums you are speaking sing hey the mystic sailor that you are the answer to them vainly i am seeking sing hey the merry maiden and the tar of course the captain was completely puzzled having no idea what dead eye was alluding to so dick explained kind captain your young lady is a sighing sing hey the simple captain that you are this very night with rack straw to be flying sing hey the merry maiden and the tar captain corcoran was dreadfully distressed at this piece of information but he pulled himself together with an effort and replied after a moment with his rhyming dictionary good fellow you have given timely warning sing hey the thoughtful sailor that you are i'll talk to master rectstraw in the morning sing hey the cat o nine tails and the tar and so singing captain corcoran produced from his pocket a beautifully inlaid little presentation cat o nine tails and as he flourished it he brought it down accidentally but heavily on poor dick's back dick grateful for any attention pulled his forelock respectfully and trundled off into the forepart of the ship i ought to explain that the cat o nine tails is a cruel kind of whip with nine thongs which was at that time commonly used in the navy to punish badly behaved seamen but captain corcoran was much too humane a man to use it it happened to be in his pocket because it was a present from his dear old white-haired apple-cheeked grandmamma which had only arrived that day dick deadeye had warned the captain just in time for as dick crept off the captain saw a large body of the crew with rafe among them advancing on tiptoe towards the boats which were hanging from irons called davits in the ship's side and at the same time josephine came out of her cabin with her handbag in her hand and crept silently to where rafe was standing it was more than flesh and blood could stand and in the anger of the moment the captain exclaimed a oh, bother and brought the cat o' nine tails down on the breech of a gun which happened to be handy all the crew were dreadfully startled why what was that said bob butlin one of the sailors who had not yet spoken it was only the cat said bill boom bill boom was perfectly right it was the cat as josephine met rafe and while the crew were mustering on the quarter-deck the captain glanced hastily through his rhyming dictionary and having found what he wanted revealed himself exclaiming hold much alarmed and greatly astonished to find their captain among them they all held captain corcoran advanced and seizing his daughter by the hand twirled her away from rafe rackstraw who looked like the apollo belvedere struck stupid naughty daughter of mine sang the captain i insist upon knowing where you may be going with the sons of the brine for my excellent crew though foes they could thump any are scarcely company for a lady like you rafe wasn't going to stand this he had been taught by the first lord of the admiralty that a british sailor is the finest fellow in the world and if you can't believe a first lord whom can you believe so pulling himself together he began haughty sir when you address 
poetry please said captain corcoran i allow no sailor to address me in prose rafe thought for a moment and then declaimed in the key of g proud officer that haughty lip uncurl the captain uncurled his haughty upper lip as desired vain man suppress that supercilious sneer he suppressed it at once for i have dared to love your matchless girl a fact well known to all my messmates here i humble poor lowly born the meanest in the port division the butt of epauletted scorn the mark of quarter-deck derision have dared to raise my wormy eyes above the dust to which you'd mould me in manhood's glorious pride to rise i am an englishman behold me and at once all the crew carried off their feet with enthusiasm shouted their own domestic national anthem led by the energetic mr bobstay he is an englishman for he himself hath said it and it's greatly to his credit that he is an englishman for he might have been a russian a french a turk or prussian or perhaps i tal i an but in spite of all temptations to belong to other nations he remains an englishman and when they had finished all the crew wiped their eyes which were full of manly tears and shook hands with each other until their emotion had in some degree subsided indeed three or four of them were carried off in hysterics and had to be revived with eau de cologne a tub of which always stood in the forecastle speaking for myself i do not quite see that rafe rackstraw deserves so very much credit for remaining an englishman considering that no one seems ever to have proposed to him that he should be anything else but the crew thought otherwise and i dare say they were right captain corcoran hardly knew how to act for he so seldom got into a tearing rage that he didn't know what it was considered usual for a man in tearing rage to do he was anxious not to overdo it and at the same time he felt that it was necessary to let them know that a tearing rage was what he was in after some reflection and a glance at his dictionary he concluded that the best way was to depart from his usual calm correct way of speaking and horrify them by introducing some really unpardonable language so he exclaimed in uttering a reprobation to any british tar i try to speak with moderation but you have gone too far i'm very sorry to disparage a humble foremast lad but to seek your captain's child in marriage why hang it it's too bad yes hang it it's too bad i don't care i will say it and risk the consequences yes hang it it's too bad the crew were awestruck for they had never in all their experience of captain corcoran known him to forget himself as far as to use an expression of this description three times too not once but three times as if he revelled in his wickedness and what made the circumstances more impressive was that as their amazement and agitation subsided they saw the first lord of the admiralty standing apparently thunderstruck in their midst i am appalled said sir joseph as soon as he could control his tongue simply appalled there was no mistake about it he was quite white with the shock that the captain's language had given him he was no longer a first lord he was a monument of pathetic imbecility to your cabin sir said he trembling with emotion and consider yourself under the strictest arrest sir joseph said captain corcoran pray hear me to your cabin sir and a couple of marines marched him off under the command of the smallest midshipman in the ship sir joseph had by this time somewhat recovered his composure now tell me my fine fellow said he addressing rafe rackstraw how came your captain so far to forget himself please your honour said rafe pulling respectfully at his forelock it was thus wise you see i'm only a topman a mere foremast hand don't be ashamed of that said sir joseph a topman is necessarily at the top of everything this of course was not the case but sir joseph having been a solicitor did not know any better 
well your honour said ralph love burns as brightly on the forecastle as it does on the quarter-deck and josephine is the fairest bud that ever blossomed on the tree of a poor fellow's wildest hopes sir joseph could scarcely believe his ears are you referring to uh, uh, miss josephine corcoran gasped sir joseph that's the lady sir said ralph in fact here she is bless her little heart and josephine rushed into ralph's outstretched arms she's the figurehead of my ship of life the bright beacon that guides me into the port of happiness the rarest the purest gem that ever sparkled on a poor but worthy fellow's trusting brow the crew burst into tears at this lovely speech and sobbed heavily it had quite a different effect on sir joseph who forgetting all his dignity danced about the deck in a blind fury you you impertinent presumptiful disgracious audastical salmon kaler exclaimed sir joseph chopping up and transposing his letters and syllables in a perfectly ridiculous manner i'll teach you to loll in fov with your daptons cotter away with him to the darkest dungeon on board of course he meant to say the darkest dungeon on board and would have said it if he'd had his temper under proper control josephine clung to ralph and declared that as he was to be shut up in a cell she would go with him but they were violently torn asunder and a pair of handcuffs having been placed on ralph's wrists by the sergeant of the marines he was taken away in custody at this point sir joseph became calm and coherent again and as for you miss corcoran he began but before he could say what he was going to say whatever it was little buttercup came forward and exclaimed hold why sir joseph asked not unnaturally because i have a tale to unfold she replied we are all attention said sir joseph proceed and little buttercup proceeded thus ah many years ago when i was young and charming as some of you may know i practised baby farming the crew were most interested in this piece of news and expecting that she was about to reveal something that would entirely alter the aspect of affairs they muttered to each other now this is most alarming when she was young and charming she practised baby farming ah many years ago little buttercup continued to tender babes i nussed one was of low condition the other upper crust a regular patrician again the crew said to each other by way of explaining how the case stood now this is the position one was of low condition the other a patrician ah many years ago this having been made quite clear to them little buttercup continued the story oh bitter is my cup how could i do it i mixed those children up and not a creature knew it this was quite an inexcusable piece of carelessness on the part of little buttercup if she had any doubt which was which she could so easily have tied a bit of blue ribbon round the neck of one and a luggage label round the neck of the other the sailors were surprised at this culpable neglect of duty and replied however could you do it some day no doubt you'll rue it although no creature knew it so many years ago little buttercup not heeding their interruption concluded her confession thus in time each little waif forsook his foster mother the well-born babe was rafe your captain was the other again the crew explained the situation to each other that there might be no mistake about it they left their foster mother the one was rafe our brother our captain was the other ah many years ago here was a pretty kettle of fish rafe was properly speaking a captain in the navy and captain corcoran was only a common sailor am i really to understand said sir joseph that during all these years each has been occupying the other's position that said little buttercup is the idea i intended to convey and you've done it very well said sir joseph and all the crew applauded so vigorously that little buttercup thought they wished to hear it all over again and had actually got so far as ah many years ago when sir joseph interrupted her 
let them both appear before me at once said he and immediately a wraith appeared dressed in captain corcoran's uniform as a captain in the navy and captain corcoran in wraith's uniform as a man o' warsman this had been carefully arranged by little buttercup herself knowing that the time had come when it would be necessary that she should reveal her secret she had previously caused one of captain corcoran's uniforms to be conveyed to rafe's quarters and one of rafe's uniforms to be placed in captain corcoran's cabin with a note pinned to each bundle explaining the condition of affairs now we see what little buttercup meant when she sang those mysterious lines to captain corcoran about things being seldom what they seem skim milk masquerading as cream and so forth oh she was a knowing one i can tell you was little buttercup as corcoran no longer a captain stepped forward josephine rushed to him in amazement my father a common sailor she exclaimed yes said corcoran it is hard is it not my dear during this time rafe was too much occupied in trying to catch sight of the two epaulets which glistened on his shoulders to attend to anything else this said sir joseph is a very singular occurrence and as far as i know nothing of the kind has ever happened before i congratulate you both then turning towards captain rackstraw as we must now call him he said indicating corcoran desire that remarkably fine seaman to step forward corcoran said captain rackstraw three paces to the front march just as corcoran when he was a captain had said to rafe corcoran however knew his rights and wasn't going to stand being spoken to in this abrupt fashion if what said corcoran touching his cap i don't understand you said captain rackstraw haughtily if you please said corcoran with strong emphasis on the please perfectly right said sir joseph if you please oh, oh of course said captain rackstraw if you please and corcoran stepped forward and saluted like the smart man o warsman that he was you're an extremely fine fellow said sir joseph turning him round as he inspected him yes your honour said corcoran who was still too good a judge to contradict a first lord of the admiralty so observed sir joseph it seems that you were rafe and rafe was you so it seems your honour said corcoran with a respectful pull at his forelock well said sir joseph i need not tell you that after this change in your condition a marriage with your daughter will be out of the question don't say that your honour replied corcoran love levels all ranks you know sir joseph was rather taken aback by being confronted with his own words but having been a solicitor he was equal to the occasion it does to a considerable extent said sir joseph but it does not level them as much as that it does not annihilate the difference between a first lord of the admiralty and a common sailor though it may very well do so between a common sailor and his captain you know i see said corcoran that had not occurred to me captain rickstraw said sir joseph what is your opinion on that point i entirely agree with your lordship said rafe whose love for josephine overcame all other considerations if your lordship doesn't want her i'll take her with pleasure he said this because fine fellow as he was and deeply as he loved josephine he considered that it was his duty as an officer in the navy to give sir joseph the first choice then take her sir and mind you make her happy and captain rackstraw arranged with josephine that they would go on shore at once and be married at once fortunately the clergyman was still waiting for them although he had become rather impatient at the delay during this conversation corcoran had a word or two with buttercup who took that opportunity of revealing herself to him as one of the maidenly crew of the hot cross bun of twenty years ago he was greatly touched at the story of her faithful devotion to him and determined to repay it my lord said he to sir joseph i shall be quite alone when josephine marries and i should like a nice little wife to sew buttons on my shirt and mend my socks by all means said sir joseph can you suggest anybody corcoran presented a blushing little buttercup to sir joseph who gave her sixpence on the spot as a wedding present 
little buttercup was so touched by sir joseph's liberality that she burst into tears corcoran overjoyed at once broke into song adapting on the spur of the moment the well-known and familiar words with which he used to greet his crew every morning thus i was the captain of the pinafore and all the crew chorused and a right good captain too corcoran and though before my fall i commanded of you all i am a member of the crew i shall marry with a wife in my humble rank of life and you my own are she indicating little buttercup i must wander to and fro but wherever i may go i shall never be unkind to thee and the crew sang rather slyly what never replied he uh, no never the crew more slyly still what never and the captain whose experience of his former wife had taught him that even the most amiable married people will fall out occasionally replied hardly ever hardly ever be unkind to thee and they all sang then give three cheers and one cheer more for the hardy seaman of the pinafore for he is an englishman and he himself hath said it and it's greatly to his credit that he is an englishman for he might have been a russian a french or turk or prussian or perhaps italian but in spite of all temptations to belong to other nations he remains an englishman in short there were general rejoicings all around lemon ice shoulders of mutton ginger beer and meringues a la creme were served out in profusion and sir joseph who happened to know a number of surprising conjuring tricks brought a rabbit smothered in onions out of his left boot to the intense delight of the crew all the sisters and cousins and aunts of sir joseph tumbled out of bed as soon as they heard the news and came on deck after a hasty toilette a general dance followed in which ralph and josephine particularly distinguished themselves and then they all went on shore that the clergyman who had nearly grown tired of waiting and wanted to go home to his breakfast bacon might join the happy couple in matrimony corcoran was married at the same time to little buttercup and captain rackstraw most kindly gave him a week's leave that he and his wife might go and enjoy some sea bathing at ventnor captain rackstraw proved to be a most excellent commander and was just as much beloved as captain corcoran had been while corcoran took up ralph's duties with enthusiasm and became one of the smartest top men on board it is an excellent test of a man's character when he resigns himself with cheerfulness to a sudden change from dignified affluence to obscure penury and i can't help thinking that on the whole he was a very fine fellow but still i do wish he had not made that very unfortunate remark about being related to a peer end of chapter four end of the pinafore picture book the story of h m s pinafore by w s gilbert